Well, we first of all want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Grace Davenport and I am the Trail Tourism Program Manager for Anacostia Trails Heritage Area, otherwise known as Maryland Milestones. We welcome you to our artist talk tonight. Um, I first want to get into some housekeeping. Uh, this video is being recorded. It will be available within 24 to 48 hours for sharing on our YouTube channel. So um, make sure you look out for that link that I will be sending. Um, all of the participant audio and video is turned off. Uh, you can submit your questions through the question box, or um, if you have any technical issues, you can submit those there, and I will try to help you with that. And we will be having a Q&A after the talk. So Anacostia Trails Heritage Area is one of the 13 state certified heritage areas within Maryland. We encompass the Northern Prince George's County region. We're made up of 17 communities and we have a budget of about 200,000. We have a staff of one full-time, two part-time and one volunteer. And our focuses are history, art, culture and natural resources. We provide grants through the state, technical assistance and partnership building. So this is a map of our heritage area with Laurel to the north, Colmar Manor to the south, and Bowie to the east. And this is our heritage center located in the Pyramid Atlantic Art Center in downtown Hyattsville. The car is no longer there, unfortunately. So um, as a part of our support of the arts, we host rotating exhibits in our heritage center. Um, and tonight we're here to talk about uh, the one that is up right now. Uh, we will be going behind the scenes at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and into the mission operations of the Hubble Space Telescope with Jim Geletic and Rebecca Roth. Jim is the Deputy Program Manager for the Hubble mission. He has been on the mission for 22 years and has worked at NASA for 36. He was born and raised in Avalon, PA, a suburb of Pittsburgh, and he got his under, undergrad degree in engineering from the University of Pennsylvania and his master's in engineering management from GW. Jim is here to give you a quick overview of our mission. Um, and Rebecca is here with us. She is the image coordinator for um, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, though she didn't realize that Rebecca spent much of her career preparing for her current position as a social media specialist and image coordinator at Goddard. Rebecca studied documentary photography at Rochester Institute of Technology before she started at NASA 11 years ago. Earlier in her career, Rebecca worked as a photojournalist and then photo editor for newspapers, including Roll Call magazines, including USA Weekend, and National Geographic's television and film division. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and here are our lovely talkers with us. Um, and I am going to give the controls over to Jim. All right. Well, I'd like to thank the Maryland Milestones, first of all, for putting our exhibit up uh, and having us here tonight to talk about it. Uh, Hubble is a very famous image, and it's probably why some of you are here to, to learn about it. So I'd like to give you a, a quick overview. It's been flying for about 30 years, and uh, it has taken over 1.4 million observations of the universe. And now that data has created almost 18,000 papers that have been published in scientific journals on its discoveries. And those papers have been referenced in other papers over 900,000 times. So Hubble is one of the most successful missions in the history of NASA. But it didn't, uh, it actually started, the whole concept of Hubble started back in 1946. Now remember that's before the first uh, satellite was launched. It was before any rockets had even gone into space and before NASA even existed. It was started by this gentleman here, a mild manner professor named Lyman Spitzer, who wrote a paper um, about the advantages of putting a telescope above the Earth's atmosphere and how it would get us all kinds of discoveries, better images, etc. He would team up eventually with a guy named John Bacall, who, and those two would lobby Congress uh, to help 
try to get a project called uh, the Large Space Telescope started, while another woman by the name of Nancy Grace Roman, who was the first executive, a woman executive for NASA, who was put there to start a space astronomy program, lobbied NASA from within. And the three of those together helped make uh, the Hubble Space Telescope project come to light and when it was approved in 1977. It took us 13 years to get in space, uh, and uh, but its rewards have been great. Now, why did he want to put a telescope in space? What are the advantages of putting a telescope in space? Well, the first one is we can see fainter objects because the Earth's atmosphere will block some of that light or will bounce off the Earth's atmosphere and we can't collect as much of it. Uh, we can see different wavelengths of light, like ultraviolet light, it's blocked by the ozone layer, and that's good for us on the ground, but it's not good for astronomy. Uh, we can get consistent viewing conditions, so we can go back day after day after day and look at the same object and collect data, and nothing changes in terms of the atmosphere above us. So it's not rainy one day or hazy another day, so we can get consistent viewing. And finally, you can get higher resolution pictures. So if you're up in space, you can get a resolution sometimes up to 20, 10 to 20 times higher. So think about a, taking a picture with one megapixel camera and then comparing that to the same picture of that same object that's taken with a 20 megapixel camera. And that's the kind of advantage you should get. So just a quick example of the high resolution. This is a picture that would be something like you'd see with your eyes if you went out at night. The middle big dot is the moon, of course, and the bottom right is Venus, and the top left dot is Jupiter, so it would appear as a bright star. So we're going to concentrate on Jupiter here for a second. Now, if you went and looked through a telescope like Galileo looked at 400 years ago, who's credited as being one of the first persons to ever use a telescope to look at astronomical objects, you would see something like this. A circle that was Jupiter was no longer just a dot, and then a couple stars around it, which are its moons. Now that's about a one and a half inch wide telescope that took that picture. Now, if you go down to the ground and you use an eight foot telescope, which is the same size as Hubble's main mirror, that's the kind of image you get. But when you take that eight foot telescope, that eight foot mirror, and you put it up into space, this is the kind of image that you get. This is an image taken of Jupiter by the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see all the details that you can't see before. And you can see details on its moon Io. In fact, when we zoomed in on the, one of the images that Hubble took, we even saw a plume from a volcano on Io as it was erupting. Another quick example is just these different things of being able to see different kinds of light. So this is an image of the famous Eagle Nebula, one of the most famous pictures ever taken by Hubble, uh, which is about star birth. And this is a picture taken in infrared light. The first one was visible light. You can see the difference. With infrared light, I can see through the cloud and see that there's are tens of thousands of stars inside and behind that cloud that otherwise I would never have a clue that existed. So that's the reason we put a telescope up in space. So Hubble was built, launched in 1990. Uh, unfortunately, things didn't go well at the beginning because that main mirror, that eight foot mirror wasn't curved properly. So it was actually off by just a little bit around the edges, 1 50th the width of a human hair but that was enough to make all the images blurry. So Hubble ended up being the, uh, the butt of a lot of jokes. Uh, it had a lot of people mad, the general public who thought that we wasted the money, the astronomical community, et cetera. But there was one silver lining to this, and that was Hubble was built to be serviceable by the astronauts. So there were doors that you could open to get to things and easily take them in and out, different pieces of hardware. There were large connectors that the astronauts could grab with their uh, bulky gloves, et cetera. So they went up and they put a fix on Hubble to fix that problem with the main mirror. This was the image of a galaxy core of M100, the galaxy M100, and that's how blurry it was before they put the fix in, and this is what it looked like after the fix. So not only did it improve Hubble's vision, um, but it also uh, proved the idea of servicing satellites in space. So Hubble and the Hubble Space Telescope project and NASA would go on to service Hubble five times, fixing things, upgrading its technology, putting on new higher resolution cameras, et cetera. And what that did for Hubble was that allowed us to make break, breakthrough discoveries in the area of astronomy. So we've seen things like this, the, the picture I showed you before of the Eagle Nebula 
Um, this is showing you both star death and star birth. The star death is all that cloud that's there. That's the remnants of a star that exploded millions of years ago that went supernova. And those little fingertips you see on that tower on the left all the way up, the really little tiny points, those are potential stars being born from the dust that's left over from the star that died millions of years ago. So we got to see star birth up close and personal for the first time. We got to see planetary formation. These are disks of gas and dust around newborn stars. And in those disks are planets being formed, just like what happened when our solar system. So we got to see it for the first time. We get to study exoplanets. Those are planets that go around other stars other than our sun. Typically what we do is we actually study the atmosphere of those planets to figure out um, what those atmospheres are made of. Do they have water in it? Do they have oxygen and et cetera? Possible signs for life. We never even thought we could do that with Hubble when it was launched, but we figured out how to do that now. We studied our own solar system, such as Jupiter, and watched its red spot shrink over time. So we don't know what that means. Maybe the red spot won't be here in some future year. We studied black holes. In fact, Hubble proved the existence of black holes. Uh, in the center of almost all galaxies. In this picture, the bright thing on the top left is the black hole. It's actually, you can't see it. It's all the stuff glowing that it's sucking in that's around it. Uh, and then there's a long jet of particles that are being spit out of its magnetic field. Hubble also took deep fields. These are areas of the sky where we stare at one spot for uh, 10 days. The first one was for 10 days. And this is what we found in an area we didn't think there was anything in there. We found 6,000 galaxies. So we did it again, this time for 11 days with a new camera we put on board that was much higher resolution and was even more sensitive to dim light. And we got this picture. This picture has 10,000 objects in it. So Hubble um, has allowed us to get an idea of how much stuff there really is in the universe and then watch galaxies evolve over time as some of these galaxies are newborn galaxies and other galaxies are older galaxies and we can see how they've changed over time. We've also studied something called dark matter. This is the uh, a substance that you can't see but you know it's there because of its effect on other things around it. That cluster of bright lights in the middle is galaxies and the weight of the galaxies, the gravity of the galaxies and the gravity of the dark matter that we can't see actually bends space and time and causes galaxies that are behind it to actually appear all around it. And that's what that little blue swath is. So if you look at these images here, 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 et cetera, these are all the same galaxies that were hidden behind this galaxy cluster in the middle. But because of the dark matter, we can now see it because it actually brightens it, bends the light around this galaxy, and enlarges it for us. Once you have that, you can actually get an idea of where all the dark matter is. So now we can map this dark matter, even though we can't see it, because we know it must be there to cause those bending of the light. And finally, we've finished the, uh, we figured out that not only the universe is expanding, but because we knew that, but the expansion rate is actually increasing. And the reason it's increasing is because there's something now we realize called dark energy. And dark energy is pushing things away from each other and causing that expansion rate to speed up. That actually won a Nobel Prize for three different scientists, including Adam Reese, who was one of the scientists on the Hubble Space Telescope team. So Hubble um, has been very successful in science, but there's a lot of other things behind Hubble that most people don't realize. One of those is technology transfer. So we we got a lot of new technology we had to develop for Hubble, and we spun that off to help us in our everyday lives. So for example, our image processing algorithms that we use are used for the cameras that are used in you when you have arthroscopic surgery. Our scheduling systems for scheduling our observations are used in the semiconductor industry and also are used in the hospitals to help shorten your stay. The management software that we use for processing our images it was used to help map the human genome. Our star catalogs are now available as star maps for amateur astronomers. The filters on our cameras, you would actually find in hardware stores. So when you go to a hardware store and you give them a paint sample and you ask them to match that color, that machine is using the filters that were created and developed for Hubble. The 
pattern matching algorithms that we use to identify stars we now use for wildlife. So in this case, this is a whale shark and the pattern of the dots are like a fingerprint. So those algorithms then match those dots and we can tend to determine whether or not we've seen that whale shark, shark or not before. So no longer do you have to tag the animal, you can just take their picture and identify them that way. Our CCDs, our charge couple devices that make our cameras images uh, that are in ultraviolet are used in mammography in the fight for breast cancer. And our infrared detectors that we use in our infrared cameras help us look at old documents such as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of those documents have deteriorated, so they look black in visible light, but as you go down the infrared spectrum, you can actually read them again. And then finally, uh, Hubble has become part of our culture. So this technology transfer, the science and all that has become part of our culture. So you can go to the stores and you can buy um, or, or, or rent you know, online all kinds of videos on documentaries on Hubble. Uh, there's hundreds of books. We've been on hundreds of uh, magazine covers. Its images are, in, are used for stained glass windows in churches, on covers for uh, albums. Some places have taken to using Hubble images for clothing designs. Stamps have Hubble images on it, not just from our country, for, from countries everywhere. Um, the the U-Haul truck, that you see in Maryland has the Hubble on the side. Museums use Hubble images as artwork. Our spectrographs have been used for a laser light show that shines on the sides of buildings and museums. People have Hubble tattoos. and We've even been part of the Google Doodle. And this year as part of the Mint's um, innovation coins, we are now on the dollar coin uh, for Maryland. So Hubble has kind of been come embedded in our culture because of all these interesting things, not only just the science and that, but also the technology transfer, the servicing missions, the failure at the beginning that became a huge success, et cetera. So Hubble can also be seen on televisions. So it's still embedded in our culture there. So you see it on our old shows like Star Trek Voyager and Home Improvement, and you can see it in our new comedies or our existing comedies. The Big Bang Show is an example. It just went off the air, but, uh, and Gravity. They, you can see it in our movie theaters as well. So the likeness of Hubble is everywhere. So Hubble has, has basically cultivated itself into our pop culture um, and also changed our fundamental understanding of the universe. And we intend to keep it changing our fundamental understanding of the universe because Hubble is in very good condition. So we still have uh, redundancy in all of our critical systems. So, so we are hopeful that we're gonna be able to keep Hubble going late into the next decade or this decade, the 2020s, um, if not beyond, because of that redundancy that we still have. And it's up to now, because we don't have any more servicing missions. The servicing missions were based on the uh, space shuttle, which has now since been retired, and now we have new vehicles to take us into space, but they don't have the current capability that's needed for servicing Hubble. We now rely on a team of a couple hundred people at the Goddard Space Flight Center and also up at the Space Telescope Science Institute on Johns Hopkins University campus to keep Hubble going, to keep it making these breakthrough discoveries, these incredible science discoveries, um, and to keep it operating so that it can make those discoveries, which gets harder and harder as the hardware gets um, older and older. So. Um, so what we did was we did ask, uh, and this is a picture taken by Rebecca, who's gonna talk to you tonight. Um, Rebecca has done a, a great job in uh, documenting. We wanted to actually document the behind the scenes of Hubble operations for where we're doing the work at the control center so that people will be able to see images of when we have problems with the spacecraft, how do we respond? What is the day-to-day -day like? to be able to do all this incredible science and incredible images. So Rebecca has taken that on. She's an outstanding photographer. We were lucky to be able to get her to be able to do this for us. And that's one of the, the things that she's gonna to talk to you about tonight. So if you wanna to continue to follow Hubble, you are, are welcome to do so. And we are, uh, you can go online at uh, nasa.gov slash Hubble. That's our website. And you can find all things Hubble there, or you can follow us on social media at NASA Hubble. But tonight's 
talk is really about Rebecca Roth and all the great work that she has done for us and she's continually doing, even during the pandemic, uh, to try to document this whole effort that we're doing to keep Hubble as, as absolutely scientifically viable as possible. So I'm gonna pass it back to you, Grace. All right, thank you so much, Jim, for that amazing introduction. And Rebecca, you should receive the um, present presenter status. There you go. Um, wow, Jim, that was really great. Um, I It's like just sitting here listening to him, you know, walk through a quick timeline of Hubble, but especially, you know, sharing the information about the technology transfer and, um, you know, how Hubble has become uh, really ingrained in, into our lives. Um, I don't know, it just, it makes me feel um, like so lucky that I've been able to uh, not only work at, at NASA Goddard at, um, for 11 years, but to be able to work on this project um, in Hubble's uh, 30th year, uh, which Jim, as Jim mentioned, we just celebrated. So just real quick about myself, um, you know, thanks to Maryland Milestones for um, making this possible. And for those of you who, you know, live in uh, the College Park, Prince George's County, DC area, the, the exhibit is up um, and you can see it in person. Um, so just real quick about myself, I, um, I've been in Washington for quite a while. I've been here since about 91. I studied uh, photography, photojournalism at Rochester Institute of Technology and worked on Capitol Hill and Roll Call newspaper and National Geographic. And then I found myself at NASA 11 years ago. And um, I don't know, I, I, it's, it's a great job and it's a lot of fun. And so while I do spend most of my time uh, in the office or now at home in my home office, um, I do social media and I work as a photo editor and I do some shooting every once in a while. I get to go out and, and shoot some cool pictures, but um, that's enough about me. So Jim um, already gave you a pretty good overview of Hubble and I had some, some cool facts here uh, to share with you guys about that, but um, I've never followed him in a, oops, I never followed him in a talk and so I realized we have uh, some of the same talking points, but um, so I just really wanted to, you know, at first um, share, you know, this is probably one of uh, Hubble's most iconic views um, the, the pillars of creation and, um, you know, moving forward, this was, um, it is now one of my favorite Hubble images um, that they nicknamed the Comic Reef. And this was released just this past spring um, in April, I believe, uh, for Hubble's 30th anniversary. Um, it's just a really gorgeous view of uh, nebula and um, I guess uh, this neighboring, the blue part is a star forming region. So, and, and this, I just, I only was showing like three images, Hubble images, because it, it's, 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 it's not, you know, about me, it's, it's about the telescope and the images um, that, you know, these folks at Goddard and, uh, you know, all their hard work um, and brain power that, that give us uh, these amazing views. And so, um, so this is, you know, so this is the beginning of, of some of the images that I've shot. Like Jim said, uh, the, the, the outreach team, the team who does social media, it's the team who, um, you know, goes to schools and, and projects and, and um, outreach events where you might go to a museum or something. And um, they were planning on what they wanted to do for Hubble's 30th anniversary. And like Jim said, um, they decided to, um, since I work in the Office of Communications at Goddard and my background as a photographer that, um, you know, that I could spend some time sort of creeping around. Um, and, and in this case, it's the missions operation uh, room where uh, these folks command uh, the telescope. And, you know, what was interesting for me is that, um, you know, even after having been at Goddard at NASA for over 10 or 11 years, like I didn't really uh, know that much about, you know, what was still going on with Hubble. Like I, 
maybe like a lot of people um, sort of thought, you know, well, it's up there. What else is there to do? It's sending down, you know, the data and, and people are processing it. But I had no idea, um, you know, the number of people um, that it takes to, you know, send commands uh, to, to the telescopes. And oops, here we go. And um, like these are, this is uh, an operations manager and uh, the chief system engineer, um, they're mo monitoring a test. And so um, they send, um, before they send a change, there's software, of course, that runs the telescope. And uh, before they uh, send it uh, to the telescope, they do a test. So everything is, is tested out ahead of time to make sure it all uh, goes, goes smoothly. And, and, and for me, it was, you know, it was really a challenging assignment. As exciting as it is, I, um, and as hard as it was, it, I really enjoyed it. Um, it sort of reminded me of my days when I worked on Capitol Hill and I was covering a lot of press conferences and it was just sort of people behind monitors. And, and you're just sort of like waiting for interesting moments and looking for interesting views that, that really sort of encompass the room or the mood of what's going on and and the, you know there's was never a time uh when i was you know working around these people that you know you could just see how serious they were about their work and how how hard that they're concentrating and it didn't you know i mean as as, as a photojournalist who's sort of you know trying to be a fly on the wall i was going to turn off my camera so you don't have to look at me i forgot about that um there we go. So you can see the pictures a little better. Um, so, um, you know, I didn't want to in any way be disruptive to the people um, doing this work. And so this is a system engineer um, at his workstation um, in the operations support room. Um, and so this is this is another time when they were observing um, tests. Um, um, this was probably this is probably one of my favorite shots that I've taken so far. Um, it's um, you know a number of people in, in this group, including the chief engineer, chief system engineer, um, and they're they're having a discussion about um, you know, responses. I think that they were getting um, from the telescope when they sent it sent some information, and so for me. Um, I, I always sort of felt like that's how I always felt like it just seemed like you're sort of in the, you know, in, in like sort of it, in the heartbeat of, of Hubble, like the, the people sort of like Wizard of Oz, it's the, the folks, you know, behind the screens that are making this, uh, that are making the telescope work. Um, and it really sort of gives you, a, for myself, gives you such a huge appreciation for these people. I mean, and especially because of, of how well known and how much science data and how and um, you know just how much Hubble has brought humanity. I mean, it, it's not just you know here in the United States. It's a mission that is known worldwide, and its images and its data are used by scientists worldwide. And so you know, it's it's people look at the pictures and they don't think about people. They don't, like for, for myself, like I even said, like having been at NASA for so long, you know, I, I took for granted that, oh, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's up in the sky, it's, it's still working, it's going, it's looking where they want it to look and it's sending pictures and that's all, but not at all. And so um, it's just really, you know, I've always, um, it's really like all these people behind uh, the scenes um, who are who are there making sure that you know every everything that they do um, is perfect. I mean, there's just um, there's no way around it when you're dealing with with uh, you know these these types of situations. Um, I did have an opportunity to photograph a, um, a monthly meeting of the managers, and um, this is um, one of the the, the managers. Um, and he's responsible for um, a lot of the uh, uh, contractors at Goddard who work on um, Hubble operations. And so each manager would come and give a presentation at these at these meetings. And um, you know, it, it doesn't take long uh, when you're a photographer working at NASA uh, to feel like you're you're a little bit uh, over your head. But um, these folks. Um, 
you know, there's no one sitting there uh, playing Candy Crush on their iPhones in the middle of these meetings. I mean, these folks are um, just, for everyone who made a, a presentation, there was lots of questions, you know, lots of discussions, and just very thoughtful, uh, meaningful people. Um, and this is a um, this is a ground system manager during um, one of those um, manager meetings. Um, I I, um, I was happy to see um, a, a woman as as one of the uh, mission managers, and and um, I particularly like I said it was you know this was a challenging assignment you know the the lighting wasn't great, and you know it was a lot of sort of like um, office rooms and, you know, dark rooms where you saw in the control rooms and people just sort of hunched over computers and things. And so, you know, going into a meeting, a meeting like this, you're, I'm, you know, I was literally crawling around on the floor. I didn't want to, you know, interrupt the meeting and, and just, uh, you know, took advantage of that great Hubble image in the background. And, you know, the moment where, um, Olivia was, was speaking with her hand. Okay. This, all right, this was one of the coolest things that I learned about. Um, uh, though, I don't know, I, I, I learned something new, uh, you know, all the time working at NASA. But so this is the um, the vehicle electrical system test facility, which is we they call the VEST for short, and it's an exact duplicate of Hubble's electrical system. And um, and the system was designed in the 80s and uh, you walk through there and you can see sort of like on the left, there's like these computers from the 80s with like, that would take huge floppy disks. And and so what they do is, and, and Jim's still on, and so he he's the guy who can correct me if I'm wrong, but before they even run a software test um, to the actual spacecraft, they run it through um, this duplicate um, test facility that's at Goddard, and it's just fascinating to see all the computers, all these old computers um, set up in this room, and it's really, um, you know, an important, another really important step and process um, that um, helps, helps, you know, the managers keep Hubble running and making sure that, you know, all the changes that they make, um, you know, aren't going to, do uh they're gonna be uh won't do more harm than good um so and uh here's here's um uh, so you know i said to jim when we were quarantined and goddard has has pretty much been uh shut down since the beginning of the pan pandemic and and i said to him you know if something happens i think it'd be uh really important to this uh, to this, you know, documentary that we get um, some shots of folks, um, you know, working at, at Goddard when they're under quarantine, and and I happened to uh, snap this one of Jim. He he had uh, let me into the mission control room, but he had to jump on a uh, a call, and um, he's he's kind of almost always that that uh, that serious. I don't know. You're a good guy, Jim. Just kidding. But um, and so I, I did. Um, so like I said, there's you know not just the folks at Goddard, um, but you know an interesting aspect um, to NASA and a, and probably a big reason of why I have the type of, of job that I do at NASA is that when NASA was created, it was written into their charter that they would disseminate the information with the public. And so you know with 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 Hubble, it's sort of an, an automatic and almost easy thing. Now, I don't want to make that sound like um, this is an easy job that these folks have. I mean, the Hubble team that uh, does the outreach that you see at events like this are incredible people. They're passionate people. They're people who care deeply about what they do. And I just feel really fortunate that I've been able to work with them and um, I love like, you know, going to events like this and, you know, they're standing at a table for, you know, two, three hours and, you know, probably answering a lot of the same questions over and over again. But, you know, when you work at NASA and you're sharing information about something like the Hubble Space Telescope, um, you know, it's it it can be fun, and and I think um, my experience is that the people really enjoy it. And and uh, this is one of our um, NASA 
astronaut that um, was um, on the servicing mission and they were at the um, National Air and Space Museum. And so another outreach event. And um, this next shot is, I don't know, I, I sort of feel like even though this, um, you know, this image was was taken outside of Goddard and included sort of the outreach part. This is one of my favorite shots um, from the project. And for me, I just sort of feel like it, it just really, um, it feels like this could be any of us. Like this image of these people standing in a museum, you know, um, and, and seeing these beautiful Hubble images um, in this sort of quiet, peaceful way, um, you know, making it look like, you know, showing them, uh, showing it in, in an appreciative way um, really encapsulates um, Hubble and, and the way the public feels about uh, the missions and its images. Um, so Jim shared real quick, um, you can follow uh, Hubble, um, nasa.gov slash Hubble um, and you'll you can find um, Hubble the Hubble um, um, social media sites at at NASA Hubble and um, but um, Goddard covers lots of other missions and lots of other kind of content and you can find uh, a lot of our work and um, at 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 NASA Goddard so um, I just really want to say thanks to um, Marilyn, let me see, turn this back on, Marilyn um, Milestones for uh, inviting us and I hope that um, folks can, uh, when you feel that it's safe and if you want to see these pictures um, uh, up close and personal, you can uh, swing by the gallery uh, over there near College Park and um, check them out. So I think this is the time when we were going to um, take some questions. Yes. Um, okay. So we have two questions so far, but if you have any questions that have come up, feel free to type them into the question box and I will see them and um, we will have Jim and Rebecca answer them. Um, but first I want to thank you both for um, being with us tonight, it's been really a great experience learning about the behind the scenes. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, so this first question is for you, Jim. Um, tell me about the Hubble gyros. How long can it hold out? Okay, so let me just real quickly explain what a gyro is for those who may not know. Uh, a gyro is a device that tells us if the spacecraft is turning, and how fast it's turning. So when we want to go from one object to the next object, it's important for us to know in all the directions, you know, kind of think of the X, Y, and Z type thing. We want to know if it's turning in that direction and how fast. And the other thing is when we're taking a picture, we want to be as absolute steady as possible. So you know what happens when you do this with your camera when you take a picture. Well, the same with Hubble, we want to be as steady as we can and the gyros will tell us if we're moving or not. Um, so so they're relatively important pieces of equipment. Now we had six gyros um, and they were all brand new gyros from the last servicing mission when the astronauts went up in 2009. Since then, three have failed, um, but we have three left. And those three are enhanced gyros. So they're a little different breed from the other ones. Um, and it's us trying to continually uh, improve the gyros over the years based on how they failed in the past to try to prevent them from failing. And so far, um, they've been doing those three, which are the only three enhanced ones that we had on board, um, are doing outstandingly. Um, some of them have a little bit more noise in their readings than others, but for the most part, um, they allow us to uh, use all three. And it's we like to use three gyros because it allows us to go from one pointing mechanism to another. So the question is, how long can we last? So first thing I'll say to you is that predicting Hubble's lifespan is like predicting the lifespan of your car. And it's like, how long is your car going to last? What's the next part on your car that's going to fail? Tell me now, even though it might not be for a year, but you know, what is that going to be? And there's no way to know. Um, so we can do, we do a lot of statistical analysis, um, mean time to failure type things, et cetera, to try to figure that all out. Uh, 
what we believe is that the gyros are going to allow us to last for you know maybe almost another 10 years if we're lucky so we'll get into the late part of this decade with the gyros the good news is and why we believe that and why we believe we can maybe go even further than that is we have a new mode on the spacecraft that we created maybe not as new now but it hasn't really been used a whole lot uh, about five six seven years ago uh, and that's called one gyro mode so if i go if i have less than three gyros no problem i'll just use one and i'll substitute some other sensors that i have to help me identify if I'm turning in those other directions. So we can go to a one gyro mode. We lose a little bit of efficiency when we do that. So we're not quite as fast as going from one target to the next, but that'll allow us to last hopefully for even more years to come. Well, thank you for that really helpful answer. Um, I personally didn't know what a gyro was, but now I do. Um, you know all too well. <laughs> Uh, this next question is for Rebecca. What is it like to work as an artist with so many engineers? Do you think similarly or differently? Um, that's a really interesting question. And, and um, like for me, so a big part of my job is, is sharing NASA images and sharing images not only from Hubble, but um, a lot of the other, we have a lot of Earth images and images of the sun and of the moon um, from, from Goddard. And, and um, I like two things come to mind. One is that I sort of, for me, came to the conclusion that like engineers and artists aren't opposites like people think. I think they're very much alike that they're these incredibly, well, really smart, but um, they're, uh, the ideas creative to, to, incredibly creative to come up with fixes to problems. I mean, when they build these spacecraft, they have to be able to, um, you know, take the rigors of launch, you know, it's like all the shaking and, and it has, so once it, once they create these spacecraft and it, and it can, you know, survive going up in a rocket, it then has to survive in space, right? It has to be, you know, how cold it is in space. And sometimes it's really hot. And then just all the engineering and Jim was just talking about one tiny little thing about the gyros. And then you have, you know, but so these people are like, incredibly creative and so um, on one hand um, you know there there have definitely been times when you know maybe it wasn't an engineer but a scientist who you know I saw an image and said this is incredible like this is this is so cool we have to share this with the public and and the scientist might be like I don't it's this is just you know whatever it's not that exciting I'm like yeah but this is cool and people are really going to like it and so you know on one hand there's definitely times where um, and, and it was probably like earlier on, you know, I've been doing this 11 years now. And so, you know, like 10 years ago, you know, there wasn't, Instagram didn't exist. People didn't know what Twitter was. Facebook was, was very new and it was sort of, you know, it took some time explaining to, you know, missions and, and mission team members the importance of social media. But now, you know, it's, a, it's, it's pretty, um, you know, straightforward and, and folks see, you know, the importance of sharing that information. So it's a little bit easier um, explaining, you know, why we want to, you know, release something. And so um, I, um, I have so much respect for, you know, the engineers and the designers and um, all of those folks. And like I said, so I really see them, you know, um, not far on the spectrum, but actually closer. And this uh, question might be for the both of you. Um, is everything you offer public domain or does it have some sort of cost? So as far as the, the products, when you go to nasa.gov slash Hubble um, or go to our, any of our social media, I mean, it's all free. Uh, you know, we, we ask that you credit it when you use it properly, but, um, you know, we're the federal government. So, um, your taxpayer dollar helped create that. So you are the owners. 
Uh, so it, it's for the most part free, unless yeah. there's a patent involved in something. But uh, in the cases of the things we've talked about tonight, that's not an issue. Yeah, we get, I, as, as someone who works in the office communications, I get emails. It's part of my job. I, you know, people reach out to me about using images and we get emails like weekly and literally around the globe, everything from book publishers to, you know, um, people writing science papers or kids working on science projects. And there's, you know, um, not to just mention one website, but, you know, Flickr, which isn't as popular as it used to be, um, is a great resource for people who want to access, um, if you look for NASA Hubble on Flickr, they have so many amazing sets of images and all the high-res images are there. Um, and there's, there's, there's multiple, if you go to, to nasa.gov slash Hubble, there's links to all kinds of places online where folks can, you know, send them to the printer, hang them on your wall, um, you know, make shirts. It's, it, that's why you see that stuff. And um, this question looks like it could also be for the both of you. How can students prepare for a job at NASA? Okay, so I'll, I'll try that one first. Um, the first thing I'll say is that, you know, a lot of the people that work for NASA are either scientists or engineers or something similar to technical nature. Um, it really helps to have a college degree, to have a bachelor's degree. Um, uh, at least. And, um, and so I would say that if you're interested in doing some type of technical work, you know, probably 95, 99% of the jobs will require a college degree. So when you're in high school, what you want to do is obviously you want to, you know, concentrate on the math and the sciences and that, and then go into a, a STEM type of thing uh, in college, you know, science, technology, engineering, or math. Now, I say most of the people, and this is one of the reasons I really enjoy uh, having this exhibit up and having this particular uh, set of presentations in that to the public, is that we have a lot of people who are not scientists and engineers. It takes a, it takes a lot of people with a lot of skills to do things, even on our mission. So we obviously have financial people to help us with the budget and pay our bills and stuff. And that, but we also have this outreach team that have a lot of artists um, and people with art skills involved in it. Um, we have people who are journalism majors who help us write all the stuff, help us write our press releases, help up our, our brochures, our web pages, and that. We have graphic artists that help us come up with banners that help us lay out our documents, you know, that we give to the general public, like yourselves, um, you know, for explaining what the Hubble discoveries are, and that. We have uh, videographers. And uh, we are very big in trying to explain to you the science through uh, creating videos, text on screen videos or interviewing people, and those types of videos, short videos that go on social media as well as uh, long documentaries. Um, so we have people who have theater degrees, who have video degrees, uh, et cetera, working for us. And in fact, we, the majority of our interns, our summer interns, um, and we do interns typically throughout the whole year on the Hubble project, uh, a lot of them are in the video field because we have so many videos we need to be made and it takes a lot of work to do that. And they do an excellent job, even though they're still in college or they're still in their graduate degree, they do an excellent job. So it takes a lot of types of degrees and a lot of different things. So if you're not STEM oriented, meaning you know you don't have the, the math gene or whatever, um, there are still a lot of skills that we need because you know we need, as, as Rebecca said, to get this information out to you. That's part of our charter. Um, and to do that and to do that well and do that effectively via social media or whatever mechanism we use, we need those types of skills. Yeah, and, and the only thing I, I, I probably don't really have much to add, but the one thing I do um, I think is worth uh, mentioning again is uh, NASA's internships. And we have a number of people um, who came as, as students um, in, you know, just for whether it's social media or communications, Jim, I think your new outreach social media person started as an intern and, yes, she did. Back, and then ended up coming back as an intern. And so there's, I know many people who, um, so whether you're an engineer or, you know, studying sciences or um, they hire interns across um, the center and it's a great way if you're someone who's just into NASA 
um, to you know um, to get experience. Um, so that's a that's a good good starting point. It sounds like you've both given some great starting points for anyone in our audience who is interested in working uh, for NASA. Um, this next question, will SpaceX offer more service missions in the future? So with respect to Hubble, uh, it's not in the plans. Okay, so uh, the SpaceX vehicle at the moment is being built or has been built to, to ferry things to the um, space station uh, and back. Uh, to do Hubble, if you can remember the shuttle, uh, we had a whole cargo bay and we would put thousands and thousands of pounds of equipment, tools, replacement parts, et cetera, in that cargo bay. Um, it also had a, a mechanism that allowed us to attach Hubble, a little ring that we would take Hubble down and connect it on the ring so we could turn Hubble or rotate it down for the astronauts to work. All that fit into the cargo bay. The SpaceX vehicle isn't designed for that. So uh, if they were going to service Hubble, they would have to design something. Uh, they could connect onto the bottom of Hubble, but they would have to design something to hold all that equipment and carry all that equipment and make it easy for the astronauts to be able to get to it and then go back up to Hubble to replace a part or whatever. In addition, if you remember the space shuttle, it had a robotic arm. And a robotic arm allowed us to grab Hubble and dock with it. That, that was one mechanism that we had. But just as important, um, and uh, even if we didn't need that to dock with, with the SpaceX vehicle, the robotic arm helps the astronauts move around and helps make them steady, et cetera, so they can change in and out parts easier up and down the spacecraft. Um, so that might be something that, that we would have to be considering as well. So there's a lot of additional things that would be, have to be put on the SpaceX vehicle if we actually uh, decided that, uh, if the space agency decided that they wanted to do that and service Hubble again. All right, and this last uh, question here is for Rebecca. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to both Rebecca and Jim for this presentation. I'm not only a bit of a space nerd, but also a photographer, so this hits all of the nerd buttons. <laughs> Rebecca, I noticed some excitement when you mentioned a woman in a manager's meeting. So aside from your work on your awesome images, do you find that women are still scarce in the workspace in your work um, for NASA Goddard? You know, my answer to that is no. I mean, in the Office of Communications, you know, the head of of communications at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. It's a woman, and um, I feel like I work with a lot of women. Um, um, so now, I, I think that if you asked an engineer or you know a scientist, I I can't speak to that. But um, as a photographer, I, you know I know there's other women photographers there. We have many women. Um, uh, video producers. We have a lot of women who are, um, you know, who are writers and, you know, storytellers. And so um, it's my experience that at Goddard, you know, in, in, in the area where I work, um, there, there are lots of women and there's a lot of awesome, great guys that I work with as well. <laughs> so, so I'm going to add one other point to that and say, Olivia, who is the person in the image, um, that Rebecca took that we talked about. So Olivia is really unique, okay? Uh, we have lots of women on Hubble, but Olivia is one of our three operations manager. And one of the reasons she's our, one of the operations managers, she's not an engineer. She is the only PhD astronomer that's on our engineering team. And because of that, she can look at things from a completely different perspective. She understands the spacecraft inside and out, just like a lot of our engineers do, but she also sees it from a user. And this is what I need to do to use the spacecraft. This is what I need to use, do to use the instrument. So, you know, how do I uh, marriage those two together to make sure that what we're doing in operations maximizes the potential of that instrument for her? So she's really exceptional, and we're very fortunate to have her on our team. Cool. Well, thank you both. We had a lot of great questions come in. Um, that was the last one. So uh, this will end our 
talk tonight. And I just want to thank you both again for hanging out with us and um, giving us some more information on the art exhibit and um, what the Hubble mission is all about. Well, thank Great. you for having us and thank you everybody for attending. Yep, do. Thanks. Right. Have a good night. Bye -bye. All right, bye.